Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... Before I get started, I just want to let everyone know I made a little screw-up. And what ha happened was... I accidentally deleted my Facebook fan page for Bookworm of the Damned, so first off, I would like to say I'm sorry for the inconvenience, and secondly, I would like to ask you to go to the description section of this video and click on the new link that I have provided for my Facebook fan page, and just be sure to like that page so we can stay connected a little bit more. And third, I would just simply like to say thank you to everyone for doing that and watching my videos. And um, let's just go on and push that little screw up aside. Let's just move it over there. And let's go on and get focused on this weekend's book review. Which in the last video I did, I said June was the month for Pride. And pretty much here I am representing once again. So the books I review this month will either have characters or authors who are a part of the GLBTQ plus community. And this weekend, I'm reviewing the book Hellfire by John Saul, which this book doesn't have any characters in it who are a part of that Pride community, but John Saul is an openly gay man. So for that reason, I felt it was still justifiable to review his work. And also, Hellfire does begin in the month of June. So if you like to correspond what you're reading with the time of year, June is the perfect time to read this book. Now, before I jump into the review, I just want to let everyone know that this book is very dear to my heart. And yeah, it has a great storyline, and I like the characters, everything about the book is great, but there's also a lot of nostalgia in it for me, because I remember the first time I ever encountered this title, and it was when I was in junior high, and we were just about to get out for summer, and every day when I would go to school, I would pass by this used bookstore in town, which I really miss that bookstore. I wish it was still here, and I just, I miss it so very much. It was like another home for me. And some days at the end of school, mom would let me go in, and she would give me my allowance and say, just blow whatever you want. So it was like going into a candy store. And the people who owned that store, they were a husband and wife couple, and I, if I remember correctly, their names were Bobby and Art, and they were just the sweetest people in the world. They were just absolutely wonderful, and I ended up connecting with the wife of that store very much because she loved to read horror and thriller, so we were always talking about books, and she was introducing new authors to me, and I was just... It was my wonderland. It was just my happy place. And on this particular day, I went down the horror aisle. And of course, that was the aisle I always went to. And I was looking through the books, trying to find my next read. And sitting on the shelf, there was like faced out towards me the book Hellfire. And it had a black background with this pale girl on front. And she had this highlight to her where it was like this blood red highlight. But there was also like a fire tinge to it as well. And I just remember thinking, that cover art is so kick-ass. And I really try not to judge a book by its cover. But this looks so good, I slammed my money down for it, and I had no idea what to expect with it, because I had never read Saul before, and I had no idea what Hellfire was about. So it was a total impulse buy, and it was one I do not regret whatsoever, because as soon as I went home, I devoured this book within a day or so, and that entire summer, all I did was read nothing but John Saul books. So it was a fantastic summer that year, just being able to stay in my bedroom or just hanging around outside, doing nothing but reading and drinking soda. So that was really awesome. But... With all of that aside, let's go on and get down to what you can expect from this chilling ghost story, Hellfire. Unfortunately, when I was a teenager, I did not realize that a book could be nostalgic. So, for that reason, I ended up giving away the original copy I had of Hellfire so I could upgrade for this edition that has three John Saul novels in it. 
And even though I love this edition, I really do miss the original copy that I had simply because I would like to put my hands on it and just remember the good times I had with that book. So I guess the moral of the story is, if there's something you love, don't get rid of it because one day you might just want to touch that and go back in time to when you enjoyed that object. And with there being no other advice that I have to share on that subject, we're going to go in and jump into what you can expect with Hellfire. Now, with this story, it does open up with a prologue where we are introduced to this old mill that looks over a New England village. And it's established very early on that there are some vengeful ghosts in this mill. Well, after we learn this, we fast forward to some time later where we are introduced to the Sturgis family, and they are really a dysfunctional blended family. And making up this family household, we have a mother and daughter by the names of Carolyn and Beth, which the mother's name is Carolyn. Then we have father and daughter who is Philip and Tracy, and they all live together with Philip's mother who is named Abigail, which Abigail recently became a widow. And it's at this point that we enter the story and see a little bit more into their life, and we learn that Abigail and Philip are going to reopen the old mill, which that mill belonged to Philip's dad, and Philip's father had inherited it from an ancestor as well. But the thing is, Philip's dad never really opened the mill because of all of the bad news that surrounded it. And the worst of that news was in the 1800s when a fire broke out inside of the mill and it burnt all of the children workers to death. So after that, we've had a lot of accidents go on. So it's just a good idea. Leave it closed. Let it stand and be a reminder. But of course, renovation begins and they have the intent to turn this into a mall. And as people are working on the mill to get it up to code where people can start shopping and all that good jazz, things start to happen. Like at first, you smell smoke where there's no fire. Then you hear the screaming of children where there are no children. And you also see like this weird glow that comes from the mill late at night. And as the hauntings are continuing to intensify, a spirit by the name of Amy comes forward in the story. And from here, we realize that she's going to remain bloodthirsty until everyone knows the dirty secret of why that mill burnt down and killed all those children back in the 1800s. Hellfire was published in 1986, and while Saul has previously admitted he doesn't do research, one of the strongest subjects of Hellfire regards the deplorable conditions children had been forced to work in prior to labor laws. So while Hellfire regards this subject, here are some things you may not know about the hard times in which the tragedy of this novel takes place. While child labor had always been utilized, the worst of child labor occurred throughout the Industrial Revolution. During this time, poor working conditions included crowding and unclean factories. Also, there were long working hours and hardly no safety codes. Overall, children could be paid less and were considered unlikely to unionize. Sadly, due to work, these children were unable to attend school. In turn, this created a never-ending cycle of poverty. Fun facts! Aside from John Saul being openly gay, here's a few interesting facts about him as an author. One of John Saul's strongest traits is being able to describe the young protagonist and antagonist of his novels. And in this regard, he commented in January Magazine that he creates characters based on his memories of how it felt to be a teenager and how teenagers feel like they are unique and no one has ever experienced their problems before. Also, John Saul claims to be a thriller author and he does not regard himself as a horror writer. Now that we have that out of the way, it's time to move on to the spoilers section of this video, which if you've never read this book before, I'm going to reveal some character development and scenes that could ruin the experience for you. If you wish to skip this section, just scroll down to the comments and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top, and inside of that is a timestamp that will redirect you away from the spoilers to the thoughts section.
Now you only have 17 seconds to click away. So ready, set, go. Since everyone has had an opportunity to click away, I want to talk about a few scenes in regards to the character Tracy. Now granted, these scenes are not complex, but they do build for a very satisfying ending, and I feel that if it weren't for the character Tracy, which is a character who you love to hate, we wouldn't have about a good 70% of the drama that goes down in this book. And the first thing you need to know about Tracy and her grandmother Abigail is they are these two elitist rich bitches who have always had everything handed to them, and they really look down on Carolyn and Beth because Carolyn was more so the lower middle class income before she married Philip. So for that reason, you have Abigail and Tracy who look at Carolyn and Beth like they're street trash. So for this reason, we have when Tracy's birthday party comes around, Tracy explains to Abigail that she doesn't want Beth at her birthday party because Beth will be an embarrassment around all of Tracy's little social light friends. Well, in this aspect, you have where Abigail tells her, if you don't want Beth at your party, she doesn't have to be there. So they end up scheming where they're changing the date to Tracy's birthday party to a date when Beth will be with her biological father. And they simply are not going to tell Carolyn or Philip and hope that it will just remain under the radar until that day comes. And then they're simply going to say, oh, well, we thought we told you and play it off like that. Well, the maid of the house ends up telling Philip and Carolyn what's about to go down, and Abigail and Tracy get their asses handed to them, and pretty much at the end of the day, they're told if Beth is not allowed at Tracy's party, Tracy is not going to have a party whatsoever. So, in this regards, they have the party where Beth can attend, but once the party starts, all of Tracy's little friends treat Beth like crap, and they make fun of her, and they just tease her, and they play games that Beth doesn't know how to play. And truth be it, a lot of people say Stephen King is great with creating asshole kids. But after you read a book by John Saul, I really tend to think that John Saul is the master of creating the asshole kid. So... That moment is just kind of a petty thing that happens. Then, as the book continues, we have where Carolyn becomes pregnant and Tracy accidentally bumps into her and she knocks Carolyn down a few steps. Well, instead of showing any type of caring or concern, Tracy says, I wish you were dead and I wish the baby was dead too, which that's really the shittiest thing I could ever think about anyone saying. That's that's just really horrible. So aside from those two things, the cherry on the cake is Tracy wants to get Beth out of her house. So to do this, she ends up poisoning her own horse and blames it on Beth. And after the horse dies, they end up sending Beth off to live with her biological father for a little bit. But then Philip realizes that Tracy killed her own horse and framed Beth just to get her out of the house. So in this regards, he has Beth come back and he explains to Tracy that if she doesn't watch her P's and Q's, she's going to end up in an all-girls school school and this is going to be just Beth's playground. So at this point, and if you don't want to have the ending of this book ruined for you, then click away now. I urge you, if you have not read this, I'm about to expose the ending, so click away. What happens next is Tracy ends up manipulating Beth into believing that they're friends and Beth falls for it. And even though Beth had spoken about her friend Amy before, which of course Amy is the ghost girl that lives at the mill, she gets into a little bit more detail about their friendship. And Tracy sees this as an opportunity to finally do away with Beth, so she concocts a lie and tells Beth that they need to go to the mill and set Amy's spirit free. And so Beth ends up going along with it and they end up going to the mill where they go down into the basement and once they're alone down in there, Tracy murders Beth. 
and before Tracy can get away, all of the dead kids from the fire show up, and they trap Tracy inside, then they just burn the whole place down. And it was very satisfying to see Tracy finally get her comeuppance, but I do hate that Beth had to die. But at the same time, I honestly couldn't see the ending of this book any other way. And also, I really have to applaud the twist ending that came. And this is only something that takes place over just maybe a paragraph. But Carolyn ends up giving birth to her new baby. And it turns out that the baby is the reincarnation of Amy, and Amy still wants revenge. And even though this book didn't scare me, that note that it ended on actually did give me the chills. It should come as no surprise that I want to bitch about the characters of Tracy and Abigail in this segment, because the thing is, they think they're as smooth as duck shit sliding through a tin horn, but they just two sloppy bitches. They truly, truly are. And here's the thing that I really hated about both of those characters. They literally bitch from beginning to end about how it just feels like they think the world should revolve around them and they should get everything they want when they want. And anyone who is beneath their financial status is someone who is not good enough to be in their presence. And Abigail makes a point throughout the entire book to remind Philip that Carolyn and Beth do not deserve to be here because they are more so common folk. They aren't purebreds. They aren't someone who was born into wealth. And they constantly throw this shit up. And had I been Philip, I would have told them to shut the hell up a long time ago. And he does kind of do that in a sense, but it comes later in the book. And I honestly think that a good bitch slapping really would have just set him straight. But... Anyway, when Abigail died, I was so happy because I was like, thank the Lord, the wicked bitch is finally dead. And then when you have Tracy, Tracy carries on the bitch legacy here because what she does is manipulate and continue to whine and cry and all that shit about all kind of meaningless crap. And this is nothing but just rich people problems. And what I mean by rich people problems is they're too damn privileged to even acknowledge what a true issue is. And so that's what you have with Tracy. And so when she finally bit the dust at the end, I was like, bye, bitch, bye. But at the same time, before she died, I honestly just wanted someone to throat punch the little bitch. Because, I mean, some of the stuff she does, it's just god-awful. And I never would have dreamed about pulling some of the stunts that she did, especially with some of her remarks. And by golly, if I was Carolyn... Lord, whew, I would have made Joan Crawford look like Jesus Christ. What I found to be really interesting about Hellfire is how when I was a teenager, I connected with Beth because she was an outcast and a weirdo, which was much like myself. And as I read this again as an adult, I discovered I connected more with the adults, which were Carolyn and Philip. And that's more so because when I read it at a more mature age, I saw that this was something that was much greater than just a teenage girl being bullied by her stepsister. And speaking of being bullied, one of the things I noticed as an adult is with Tracy, you have where she bullies Beth nonstop. And that's something that I identified with as a teenager. But then as an adult, I noticed that not only is Tracy a bully here, but her grandmother Abigail is as well. And Abigail does bully Carolyn quite a bit. But the way she does it is Abigail feels like she is more poised. She feels like she is trying to save face while she's being a smart ass. And because of her methods, she just does it with a lot more grace, and it just makes your blood boil even that much more. Now, with Tracy, she is very crass, and she is very destructive, and she doesn't care what happens as long as she's okay. Which, 
truth be it, I really felt like Tracy was a sociopath now that I was older and was able to see that, oh, well, these are tendencies where as long as it doesn't affect her, it's okay. But the moment it affects her or something that belongs to her, then it's the end of the world. So that was something I had missed as a kid. And when I was reading over this again recently, I noticed that there was a lot of toxic parenting in it because you have where there's the absentee father being Philip, and he wasn't there to raise Tracy. So for this reason, you had Tracy who was raised by her grandmother Abigail, which it was pounded into Tracy's head all of the philosophies that the Sturgis family is better than everyone else, Everyone should kiss the Sturges's butt, and the Sturges should get what they want when they want. So it's that kind of grooming and also just elitism, I guess you would say, the, the whole elitist mentality that a child should not be introduced to whatsoever. And at this young, impressionable age, Tracy was introduced to all of that and groomed into being the great a bitch that she really was so there's no other way to say it but that's what she was and aside from those subjects i noticed where the book also commented on workplace ethic and safety and what i mean by this is in the 1800s where the tragedy of the mill takes place in this book you see that people have died because of their environment not being safe and also the morals of the mill owner and what you have here is the mill owner is in the mentality that as long as the mill is safe and all of the equipment is safe everything's cool there's no sweat whatsoever so his number one goal is to make sure that the facility itself remains in good condition for product to continue to go out so he can continue to get more money well with him having that mentality the bad part is he doesn't care a thing about his workers and he realizes due to them needing the money he can abuse them as much as he wants and if one of them decides to tap out or die by an accident at the mill he can easily get in another person who will replace them probably within that day so he's in the thought process that workers are disposable the workplace itself is not and even though we've grown a great deal from that mentality and workplaces are much safer now than what they were then, we do still have with some corporate businesses the mentality that money is more important, the business is more important, the worker that's the least important thing that corporate has to worry about. So we do still see a disposable mentality in regards to workers that are retail-like or things that are in that same nature. So we really see that even though the scenery has changed, the mentality of elitism is still pretty much there for the great dollar. And with all the social commentary aside, I really enjoyed the characters of this book because they were really fleshed out. None of them were stereotypes. And if it weren't for the characters, I don't believe this book would have been as colorful as what it was. And as far as a scare factor goes, I wasn't scared by this book and I wasn't creeped out by it, but I really felt like this was a good thriller and it was really a good thrilling ghost story and there's no blood or really explicit sex or anything like that in the book whatsoever. So truth be it, a teenager could read this and still enjoy it as a surface read, whereas their parents might read it and have the same response that I just explained. So overall, this kind of feels like it's a book that's suitable for most ages, I'd say 13 and up. What I love most about John Saul's work is he is a very easy read, and he's something that you can just pick up and zoom through with no complications, and at the same time you're getting a lot of information and a lot of really strong characters, and he's superb with everything and how he blends it together. And what I love so much about Hellfire and some of his other works as well is they just feel like a deeply seated American ghost story with a gothic flair 
Hellfire. And with Hellfire, it feels like this is something that you would hear about around a campfire. So with the whole urban legend vibe and the whole bad place vibe being the mill and stuff with this, it's just something that I love. It's something that I devour and I can't get enough of. So for these reasons, yes, I highly recommend Hellfire, and you can get the standalone book in print, ebook, and audiobook, so getting your hands on a copy is not hard whatsoever. On to the questions. My first question is, what is a good horror book you would recommend where the characters are a part of the GLBTQ plus community? Load up the comments. My second question is, how do you feel when an author who is a part of the GLBTQ plus community provides a work to the audience and none of the characters are a part of that pride group? Personally, it doesn't bother me. I do know people who are a part of the GLBTQ plus community who feel like they've been slighted or cheated or they've had someone else turn their back on them when there are not characters in the book that are a part of that community when the author is blatantly a part of that community. And yeah, it would be nice to see more characters that are a part of that pride community in books, especially horror books, because it's nice to be able to identify. And I'm not saying that all horror books have to be nothing but GLBTQ+. I'm just saying that I would like to see where there's more of a diversity with some horror books because the horror fan base is very diverse and you have a lot of outsiders like myself who gravitate to those books. And it's something that it really doesn't bother me, but truth be it, it would be nice to see a little bit more of that. So load up your comments on why or why not, and I promise I will not be offended. I look forward to the diverse answers, and all I ask is that you just simply respect one another with the answers that you give. And with that covered, it's now time to close out the video, which first off, I would like to say thank you to Lisa G and Joseph Baylot for contributing to my Patreon. If you would like to contribute to my Patreon as well, I have two options available once you click on the link that's in the description section. And the first option is $5 a month, and I will give you a shout out at the end of my videos for that price. And the second option is for $10 a month, I'll still give you that shout out, but once a month I'll send you over one of my photos, which I do creepy photography on the side, and from there you can print out the photo or do whatever you want with it. So those are the options that I have, and if you can contribute, that's awesome. If not, that's cool too. All I ask is that you continue to return to my channel and have a fun time. And speaking of which, if you go to the description section of this video, you'll also see links for my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so feel free to hit me up on those platforms. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, be sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell. I do have tons of more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.